Good morning.
be on a boat. You guys can be seated. Welcome this morning. Welcome to church. It, it, it always fascinates me when I come over from Sunday school and I'm getting prepared and getting ready and I'm thinking, oh man, nobody's here today. And then uh, we, we get to this point in the service and it's full. So everybody, I love, that means everybody's hanging out in the cafe, eating and visiting and having a great time. So that's, that's awesome. And so as we get started this morning, I want to welcome you. I see some folks that are visiting. I see some that have been traveling and moving around that are back with us today. Just want to welcome you. We're thrilled and glad to have you here. Uh, if you would, on the end, this end of your aisle, there is a book. If you haven't already done so, you can start that book down the line and sign in and let us know you're here today. Whether you're a member or whether you're visiting, we'd like to know that you're, you're here. Also, we want to, uh, we're trying to intentionally make sure that we reach out to those folks who are traveling and watching us online this morning. And so throughout the, throughout the service, we'll try to address them. But this morning, as of right now, it's just Carrie and Katie. I'm sure there's many others that haven't signed in, but if you're watching online, what we need you to do is go into the comment section and actually tell us you're there um, so that we can greet you and, and tell you thank you for joining us. If you will look in your bulletin this morning and, and take a look um, at the prayer needs and prayer concerns that are there, they're on the inside right here as well. There's a calendar of this week's events on the back. We'd like for you to take a look at that. If you have a prayer request, if you look on the back of your bulletin, um, please write down your prayer requests and drop that in the offering plate. And our staff will be sure to pray for that. There are a couple of announcements on the inside. Just uh, take a look at those. We have a few things coming up that I want to make sure that you're aware of. But do that, and, and I trust you to read that and know what's going on. I do want to echo uh, the comment here from the Deaconess Ministry, thanking everybody for last week. Uh, on behalf of Austin and myself, I personally want to thank all of you for the reception. It was very nice. Uh, again, I mentioned last week, I knew we were having a, a church luncheon. I didn't realize until I got back from vacation that you were doing it for a pastor appreciation. So I'm very humble, and thank you for the cards and the gifts. Um, I'm Blessed beyond measure to not only have finally answered my call in the ministry, but to be called here to this body. I love you guys. Thank you. Um, with that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for those that are gathered here with us, Lord, our church family, the visitors, people that you've led here. Lord, for those that are watching online with us. I'm grateful for each one of them, Lord, and how you're working in their life. I pray as we come together for this time of worship, Lord, that we would just empty our minds of all the clutter and busyness and distractions of the week, that we would focus our heart and everything that we are on you as we praise and worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand again with us? Lord is my shepherd. He goes before me. Then behind me, I won't fear. 
here in a second, but standing up front, you guys were awesome singing that song. I was enjoying hearing those guys. So right now we're going to go ahead and let you guys head off to Children's Church, kindergarten through fifth grade, even if you're sitting somewhere else. And before we sit down, let's take a moment of fellowship, meet each other, greet each other. If you see someone visiting, make sure to reach out and say good morning. Good morning.
As the praise team is coming down, I thought I'd do something different. I, um, I know it's been one of those weeks where there's just a, a lot of things going on in a lot of different people's lives. And so rather than mention individual things and, and risk maybe forgetting or leaving somebody out, that always makes me very nervous that I might forget. 
get somebody. What I want you to do right now is just close your eyes. If you have somebody in your life, maybe it's you, if you have a prayer need, you have something that, that you need to give to God this morning, and put on his feet, I just want you to put your right hand in the air where you're sitting. With your eyes closed and your head bowed, just put that prayer need in the palm of your right hand and let's lift it up to God. And I'm going to ask you another question. If you can think of one person in your life, in your family, at work, somebody that you know from just moving around town, Again, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if, you can, if you're thinking of a person right now that needs to know Jesus, I want you to put them in the palm of your left hand. And one, I want you to raise that hand up as well. And hopefully, with every hand raised, let's take those needs to Jesus. And let's ask for the strength and courage we need to take Jesus to the person in our left hand. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning, there are so many needs and so many things weighing on our hearts. And Lord, we know that we need to give those to you. You didn't create us to worry. You created us to trust in you. So this morning, we lift those needs to you. We put them at your feet because you are God. And Lord, because of that hope and the faith and, and the trust that we have in you, I'm also going to ask us for the courage and the strength that we need to take you and take that love and introduce it, introduce you to the person in our left hand, the person we're thinking about. Give us the strength, Lord, to let them know you, either through us and how we are handling our issues or just directly. Give us the strength. Lord, we, we give that to you this morning as we are called to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. I was looking online while the guys were singing, and I know, you know, I saw prayer needs there. Um, my phone and the prayer wall has been blown up with prayer needs. Um, I just learned a couple more while I was walking around. And, and uh, so it was just on my heart that we needed to do that. As we transition, um, you know, I've mentioned before how awesome it is the way that, that God just shows me over and over that he's in control. You know, as he's leading me, as he's leading our staff and, and uh, even our praise team or, or our guest speakers, like Ed was here a few weeks ago for me. God is moving all of those parts in a way that I'm not even aware of. And uh, I'm, I'm humbled and grateful that I've learned to just trust him with that. I don't worry about it. I'm a planner. I'm an organizer. I want to be in control of everything. And uh, I've, I'm learning still to, to just leave that to him. But the point is he can, he can always do it, and he always does do it better than I could ever imagine it anyway. And so I told you, you know, a few months ago, I, I sat down thinking, I knew that uh, uh, September and October were going to be insane with my schedule. So I sat down and I planned out two and a half months of sermons so that I would be ready. And, and, and I joked then, like, that same day that I did that, uh, our grandchild came a whole month early. And, and I was like, okay, God, I guess you, you've got this. And if you remember, the very first sermon was that God delights in our joy. And uh, I was celebrating becoming a grandfather. And I'm still celebrating being a grandfather. Um, but part of that plan, all the way back in August, was... Uh, to transition after we talked about these affirmations from the psalmist, right? And those affirmations were intended to teach us and do exactly that, affirm for us that we can trust God, that we can lean into God. And the, the intent from the beginning was that that would naturally transition right into discipleship. How do we do that? Now that we know we can trust, we know God's got us and we can rely on Him then we should be really comfortable and confident to go do what he's asked us to do. So with that plan in mind, you know, Ed comes in and he preaches to you about focusing on what God wants, focusing on Jesus. Don't be a busybody for the sake of being busy. Let's work, but let's, let's just sit at his feet and take it in. And then I texted Austin while I was gone. I said, 
hey, bud, what's your, uh, what are you preaching about? And he said, well, it's just on my heart. I think I'll preach about how discipleship can change the world. And I was like, wow. Wow, because you know what I'm preaching about for the next four or five weeks after that? How to be a disciple. What discipleship means. How we do it. What do we do? How awesome is God, right? Ten weeks ago, he knew where I'd be before I knew I'd be there. That's the kind of trust and affirmation I hope that you can all find in your lives. The question then, as we move into this and talk about discipleship, you know, what did, um, what did Austin say last week? Yeah, and, his, and I was taking notes. If you guys thought I was up on the front row texting people while Austin was talking, didn't he do a great job? It was a great sermon. Um, I love that guy. And I was taking notes and having my Bible open. And, you know, his, his message was that Jesus came to make disciples, not to make Christians. He came and gave us a task and a job to do. And when we combine that with the affirmations of knowing that God is in control, Right now, we have an understanding, we have a basis to build upon. And so the question this morning is, what, what do we do? When we talk about discipleship, what do we do and how do we do it? Well, Paul, you know, throughout the New Testament and all of Paul's letters, he writes so often about gifts, right? He talks about our gifts and he's, and he's using multiple places. He used an illustration uh, about our gifts being parts of a body, right? Christ is the head of that body and we, and the gifts that we've been given, we're all parts. And we have to work in unity as, a, as one body in order to make that function, right? With Christ as the head. He uses that a lot. We know that. But have you ever thought about what, what, what is the difference between a gift and a skill? What's the difference between a gift and a skill? Now, I might just be doing a little bit of wordsmithing, but, but there is a difference. Austin illustrated for us last week, again, as a church, I love the illustration that, that we tend to consume, maybe over-consume. I don't think it's possible to over-consume. The point is we consume, but we don't do anything. And what happens, I love, he used a little deadly analogy, which I, I thought was great. If we just eat and consume and eat, even though we're eating good food, right? We're taking in, we're being strengthened and edified. But if we just consume and consume and we never do anything, what happens to us? We get fat. We can't move, right? Can't, we're done. That's how we get sick and unhealthy. And that's the point he was making. If we're doing all of this learning and consuming, but we never go put it in action, We're in trouble. A gift will remain just a gift if we don't use it, if we don't put it to use, if we don't develop it into a skill. And the intent, don't forget, is to use that for God's glory, not our own. So I thought I'd give you an example of this. Um, I, I won't... It's David, King David. Right? He was referred to as being skilled or skillful. If you, you don't have to turn there, but if, if you were to go back to 1 Samuel um, chapter 16, verse 18. And this is, this is where David's being anointed or being called. Samuel's, or uh, Saul, sorry, he's having a rough time. God is taking his anointing away from Saul and, and figuring out what's next. Right? Again, God's, God's working Saul's just distressed. And Saul sends his people out to find a skillful musician, somebody that they can bring in um, that can play wonderful music and maybe make Saul feel better. And, and what is it? What happens? He's, this is what happens. In verse 18, Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. Who is, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person. 
and the Lord is with him. Skillful. Skillful. A man who is a skillful player. Now, what's interesting, in, in their limited perspective and their limited wisdom, they were just looking for a skilled harpist. Someone who might bring relief to the king, as I said. But in God's infinite wisdom, their search led them to so much more. Right? Led them to exactly who God was anointing to be king. We know the rest of the story. And we know how David slew Goliath. And my point about David is this. David was certainly gifted. Right? We just read. He had many gifts, not the least of which was his gift as a shepherd. My challenge is, now do you think the, the infamous shot that he threw and killed Goliath with, do you, any of you seriously think that was the first time David ever used a slingshot? Of course not. Do you think that that shot was just a, a miraculous gift? Of course God's hand was in it. But it wasn't a one-time thing. you think instead maybe it was a skill that David had honed, that he had used, that he had developed over and over again with practice throughout time as a shepherd. A gift which was developed, a gift which was developed into a skill. And not just a skill, but a skill for the exact moment when God chose to use it for his own glory, right? That's the difference between a gift and a skill. A gift will just remain a gift until we put it to use, until we develop it into a skill and then use it for God's glory. Now, I don't know if this will work. I thought I might have a little bit of fun. Maybe this is a different way to do the same thing. So... Some of you have a gift of music. But again, the idea is that you develop it, right? And I'm glad Bonnie Lenhart's not here to hear this. She was my piano teacher. A gift is just a gift unless you develop it. So everybody remembers, you know. Hours, right? You can imagine how patient I was as a child and uninterested in doing any of that, right? And those uh, Johnson teaching books, remember, you know, my, keeping in mind my sister was a classically trained pianist, so a little bit of sibling rivalry in the house. And so I'm trying, and my friends are outside playing. I've got this gift, I'm told, but I'm not interested in developing it. <laughs> right? And then uh, and I'll still screw this up. But I think this is as far as I got, right? Right? Okay. And then, if it's a gift and you keep developing it, I shouldn't tell it this way, but you know, when I got to junior high school, I had picked out a few songs on the air supply and showed my age. And uh, I was at a some, I was at something with a bunch of junior highs together, and I was playing air supply. And the next thing I noticed, there were like 10 girls standing there on the piano. And for some reason, I was all of a sudden interested in developing this gift into a skill. That is not where I intended to go with this illustration. So what happens is then you get into the, a sense of... is just a gift unless we develop it and turn it into a skill. And the intent here is that we are to use that skill to glorify God. Amen? So let's talk about basic discipleship. What, what do we do? And how do we do it? And there's a few different elements that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking about over the coming weeks. But this morning, we're going to start at the most basic thing, it simply starts 
with reading your Bible. If you want to be a disciple of Christ, read your Bible. Let's start with this this morning. You'll turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And we're going to talk about the Bible and Scripture for a few minutes. 2 Timothy verse 3, sorry, chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I'm going to read on. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would bless us as we read it. Lord, that you would prepare the ears and the hearts, Lord, that need to hear your voice through your word this morning. Lord, now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in my sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. I love that prayer. I pray it when I'm working on the sermon and I pray it while I'm giving it. I've mentioned before, right, and if you've been in my Sunday school class or a Bible study, I've talked about the difference between what a disciple is and what an apostle is. And we tend to interchange those two words, but they're different, okay? A disciple simply means student. And I don't mean simply to somehow demean it or mean it's less. Disciple means student. Apostle means messenger, Okay? So you could almost do an analogy or an illustration there, the difference between a gift and a disciple. An apostle is someone who is discipling, not just a student, but putting it to work. But disciple simply means student. William Crawford said, once being a student is easy, learning requires actual work. Basic discipleship starts with reading your Bible. As I name the sermon, this is your curriculum. If you are going to be a student of Christ, a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you're going to do discipleship, this is your curriculum. It starts by reading your Bible. It's our textbook. So, you know, I could end the sermon here and say, all right, so just everybody read your Bible, okay? Now let's go to lunch. If it were only that easy, right? If it were only that brief. Do you ever write a note for your kids? Instructions for your kids? Just to see them pick it up, stick it in their pocket, and go off? Yeah? It's just... Now, I saw my forehead, and I'm asking the same question. Has, has your spouse ever given you a grocery list or a honeydew list? Did, did you read it? Or did, did you do like me, just stick in your pocket and go to the store and hope for the best? Right? No, of course, we read it. Now, if you're like me, I throw it away so that if I made a mistake, there's no proof. <laughs> but the point is, you read it. You read it. As I could preach, if, if I were just going to preach on the doctrine of Scripture, I could, I could preach for six months about what Scripture is, what Scripture isn't. But none of that would have any impact, importance, effect, if you don't read it. And I'm going to share some statistics with you here in just a second. Scripture is your discipleship curriculum, so read your Bible. Among all the things that Scripture is and is not, the one thing that I want you to take away today is it is transformative. It was given to us to change who we are, to make us more like Christ. Scripture is transformative. So what happens when we actually do read our Bibles? If we're faithful, first... A study by the Barna Research Group, they define Bible users as people who read, listen to, or pray with their Bibles on their own at least three to four times a year. That's pretty gracious. 
Yeah. Just users. I didn't say good users. Okay. But they define good users. Three to four times a year. That they read, listen to, or pray with their Bible on their own three to four times a year outside of church. That's important. Outside of church or outside of a church event. On, based on their research, that's pretty liberal. That's pretty relaxed. Christ, the Lord is love. The percent of Bible users in the USA based on their study has remained pretty much flat for the last um, 15 to 20 years. At between 48 and 53% of the entire population. That's pretty impressive. But again, the bar is, is low. But I was surprised by that. 50%? Okay. That means the, uh, what the, the harvest is plenty, <laughs> but the workers are few. That means that verse is true, right? A second study, a different study from the Center of Bible Engagement indicated this. I think they interviewed about half a million people. When people engaged in Scripture just one time a week, and that could include you know, me on Sunday asking you to open your Bible. They count that as a game. So one time a week, if you're here, is, is me asking you to read along with me. But for people who do that, uh, it had a negligible effect on the key areas of your spiritual life. That's disheartening as a pastor. I would hope that I had more than a negligible effect on you, even if we just read this one verse every week. But that's what the statistics say. The same result was true of people engaged in the scriptures twice a week. Just two times a week, not much of an effect. Three times a week, you see a little bit of a bump. As the uh, study says, a faint heartbeat, something that moved in the behavior of the person. So one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, not much difference. But the real eye-opener came when it reached four times a week. Just four times, just, just four times a week, there was a spike. If you're like me, I, I would assume you get a nice steady increase. One, one, two, right? A nice correlation. It's not how it worked out. It was flat. But on the fourth day, four times a week, the effects spiked in an unbelievable, in an astounding way, the report says. Listen to this. If you're engaging with your Bible on your own four times a week or more, the statistics show that feeling lonely drops by 30%. Anger issues drop by 32%. Bitterness in your relationships drop by 40%. Four times a week. Alcoholism drops by 57%. That's why programs like the Hope Center and that are Christ-based and Bible study-based is why they work. Sex outside of marriage drops 68%. Feeling, spirit, feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Issues with pornography drops 61%. Now hang on. Those are all incredible. That's four times a week. Look at the impact. Listen to these last two. Sharing your faith jumps 200%. Discipling jumps 230%. Four days a week, guys. Four times, not even days, just four times. Do it all today. The results are staggering. That should be compelling, right? That should be encouraging. The impact that this book would have on your life if you give your attention to it just four times a week. Many of you can stand up here with me and testify to that, I'm sure. Scripture is transformative. It's a lot of things, actually. It's inspired. It's infallible. It's clear. I know what everybody's excuse, I can't read the Bible, I can't understand it. Well, then find a version you can understand. The language, right, the vernacular might be difficult, depending on the translation, but the message and how it's going to speak to you, it's clear. 
We serve a God not of confusion, but of love and clarity. The Bible, the Scripture, is sufficient. And it's authoritative. And I don't want to spend, I'm going to back up the sufficient. This trips a lot of people up. It's not the only thing you need, right? The early church didn't even have it. What sufficient means isn't mean, doesn't mean that, that this is the only thing. It means it is sufficient. It means it contains everything you need. You can understand God and become the type of righteous Christian you need to become by reading the Word. It contains everything you need to know. That's what sufficient means. Authoritative, we understand. It's the basis of our faith. It's the basis of, of everything we do and practice. It forges our, our theology and how we go about that. Scripture does, right, should, it does have here, I'll say, I can assure you, at least as long as I'm blessed to be your pastor, it will be the priority. Scripture will be the center and the baseline of everything that we do in worship and music in class. It's everything that we teach. It's the center of how we live a Christ-centered life. I can't overstate the importance of a personal and consistent commitment to engage with your Bible. And we should be encouraging non-believers as well as each other in that endeavor to not only study and meditate on it, but to also apply what it's teaching us in their lives and in our own lives. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Right? Think about what I just told you. Scripture is this, this particular scripture is so perfect. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, thoroughly equipped for every work. God's word is profitable. For all things. That means all things. Have a question? Check the book. All things. Have a concern? Confused about something? Check the book. It's for all things, but especially those things which Jesus has commanded us to do. Right? To love God, to love each other, to go and make the baptize and teach. It's sufficient. God's word is profitable for everything. Evangelism, education, encouraging each other for service. But we have to invest ourselves. It's a book. It's not going to read itself to us. Now, I mean, it's 2025. Yeah, I can hit a button in my car and it'll read to me. But I have to invest the time. If you want something out of it, if you want the dividend, if you want the, the result of what this book can do, all those statistics I just read to you, you have to make an investment in reproof and correction. Right? Our errors. Don't worry about the guy next to you or the gal next to you. Read the book. You know, the reproof and correction of our errors, or of our errors. In, in doctrine and what we understand, in our conduct and behavior, in our attitudes. You know, when I'm reading this book, it reveals me. It's self-revealing. I see myself, I see my own shortcomings. I see the, the gaps in my own spiritual life. And we can't uh, individually, as a church, as a society, we can't, we can't ignore it. what it says. We can't cherry pick what it says. The worst thing I can do as a pastor is pick a topic that I want to preach and then go find a verse. That's totally wrong. We can't cherry pick God's word in this respect and, and use it to just serve um, what we want it to mean or what we think is the, the current social moral. And in that regard, and, um, uncomfortably, it serves to some degree as for ourselves mainly as, as a kind of call it an early detection, early warning system, right? When I'm going astray. And there's accountability there. 
That's intentional. It's on purpose. We should use the word to see that, to learn to grow, and to avoid the trap right, of sinfulness and self-righteousness. Hopefully, that will reveal itself as you read. I've said already, the whole Bible is God's final authority for the life, for our lives, for ministry, for everything that we do. Why? Because it's God-breathed. It's God-inspired. It's God's Word. Given and inspired by God, the Scripture says. It's authoritative. It's infallible. Meaning, meaning, not talking about transcription errors or variants. Meaning it's infallible. Meaning it always tells the truth. Think about it like this. This is a great example that someone gave me in this regard about the Bible being written by men but being inspired by God. God came to us as Jesus Christ incarnate, right? Jesus was fully human and fully God, right? Your Bible is exactly the same way. It's fully inspired by God, fully written by man. You see, you see how that works? That helped me understand that. With God being the originator, it's completely true. It's entirely trustworthy. It's the final word. We need to constantly be reminded, just as I'm doing today. We need to be constantly reminded that Scripture is authoritative. In other words, to follow Jesus is to make Him the boss, right? If we're going to be disciples of Christ, if we're going to take the moniker of Christian and be a, a working disciple, then we have to put Christ first. If He isn't the Lord of all, He isn't Lord at all. Use that recently. I love it. If he isn't Lord of everything, he's not the Lord of anything. It's not enough to believe that the Bible is just the inspired word of God. That's not enough. Um, if it doesn't accomplish its purpose, if we if we don't allow it to work in us and transform us, if it doesn't serve its purpose, that's not enough. Scripture is transformative. It makes us complete. It thoroughly equips us, this verse says, right? It equips us, edifies us. It's spiritually proficient. Makes us proficient. It prepares us to, to be what? To be productive. To be effective in what God has called us to do. To love him, to love each other, to go make baptized in church and, and preach. It makes us able, as the scripture says, it enables us to accomplish every good work. Every good work that God desires of us. I share another quote before I wrap up. Complaining about a silent God when your Bible is closed is like complaining about not getting a text when your phone's turned off. If you don't feel connected to God, you don't feel God's presence in your life, and you're not taking statistically four times a week to engage with Him in His Word, whose fault is it? It's not God's. For me, there's no discussion about discipleship that's not based wholly on the Great Commission. I've already basically given it to you twice. But also Paul's urging in 2 Corinthians 5.20, he says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Think about those words, church. We are ambassadors. Say it with me. We are ambassadors for Christ. You know what that means? We represent him. We represent Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you in Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. That's the mission. We are his ambassadors. That's discipleship. So in conclusion, we need to be reminded this morning that the word of God is not just a collection of words, a collection of ancient books or texts. It's the very breath of God 
given to instruct us, to correct us, to equip us for every good work. As disciples of Christ, our commitment to reading and to meditating on the Bible is essential, is paramount to our spiritual growth, to our spiritual maturity. It's through the scriptures that we learn to live righteously. It's where we learn to deepen our relationship with God. And where we are prepared for His mission. So this morning, let's make His Word central. Let's make His Word the priority in our discipleship journey. Let's make it the basis for being a disciple for Christ and allow it to transform us into effective ambassadors for Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the message. I thank you for this time of worship to give you all praise and glory for your word. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word, Lord, for scripture that guides us, Lord, that, that shapes us and, and gives us truth, your truth, in every season, every situation in our lives. Lord, this morning, help us to not just read it, but, but to live it. Let it transform us, Lord, from the inside out. Let it change us and make a new creation. Lord, remind us of the, the power, how you enable us, how your Holy Spirit empowers us for discipleship as we, as we walk alongside others, helping them to grow in their faith, Lord, to turn toward you. And Lord, in some small way, in doing that and being obedient, how we'll transform and change ourselves and grow. And we know that this journey of discipleship is about denying ourselves, Lord, for taking up our cross and following you. It's more than just us. It's about growing your kingdom bringing more people, Lord, to know you, to know your love. This morning, equip us for this work, Lord. Let us use your word as encouragement to live boldly for you in your truth. Lord, if someone here or someone watching online needs to know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that they would, as they believe in their heart, they would confess with their mouth, Lord, that you are their Lord. Lord, if someone here knows you as their Savior, but they just need to come close, they need to draw into that relationship, they need to lean back into you and trust you, I would pray this morning that right now they would make an intentional decision to, to come back and rededicate themselves to discipling Lord, maybe somebody's looking for a church family and a place to plug in, to get into your word, to grow and be prepared, to fellowship, to work together on your mission, Lord. And I pray that you would bring that person, you would bring their gifts to be part of this body, to work in unity for your mission. But whatever the decision is, Lord, I pray that in the first act of obedience, they would share that decision publicly as a witness for how you're working in their life. Lord, use us, compel us, teach us, mold us, change us to make us more like you every day. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. This morning, I'm going to ask you to sing. As we sing, a hymn of invitation. If you've made a decision, you want to share that. If you have a prayer meeting you'd like to come and pray about, I invite you to do that.
thank you guys for a wonderful morning of worship and praise. And it just encourages you. I mean, hopefully the message would sound with you. If not, I hope the statistics did. Four times a week. And look at the outcome. I mean, there's that's that's overwhelming. So I ask you to do that. Make a commitment this week to doing that and see what happens. And then come and share with me. I want to hear the difference that that makes in your life. Before we pray, um, I just want to mention there was an opportunity in the bulletin, an insert. I want you to read over that. It's it's a chance for outreach in our community, right? It's something that we're pushing that we need to do. We're not doing the trunk or treat as a church this year, but there are a list of different uh, groups that are doing one. And so we have a great opportunity to go participate in those and represent, to be ambassadors of Christ. So I would encourage you to, to do what you've always done here, but pick one of these and go do it there. Get with Andy, get with one of the ministry chairs and coordinate with them so they know you're going. Get with Andy, we'll give you things uh, on behalf of the church to hand out. But this is a great opportunity to do exactly what we're so I'd encourage you to take a look at that, pray about that, and consider. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just we praise you and worship you this morning. You are such an awesome God. Lord, I'm humbled by the things that I get to witness in this body, the fellowship, the way that people lift each other up and care for one another, the Christ-centered living, the love. Lord, I'm just blessed and humbled by it. Lord, keep, keep us focused on you. Don't let us stumble or turn away or be distracted. Lord, I pray that each of us as we leave would be a light, an ambassador for you, a reflection of you in a world of darkness. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In your precious name, and all of God's children sing together. Amen. God bless you.